Welcome to the Awaken Heart Podcast. I'm your host, Nancy Walters. Get ready to create magic and miracles as you lean into your heart's desires. I believe not only does the heart want what it wants, but it knows. This show is a weekly deep dive into what it means to live from an awakened heart. I'll be sharing inspiring stories and real conversations with people just like you who have turned the ordinary into the extraordinary. My mission is to show you how you too can be connected and heart-centered in every area of your life. Your journey to aligning with more love, more joy, and your wildest dreams come true starts now. Welcome back to the Awaken Heart Podcast. I'm your host, Nancy Walters. And today we have with us Joe Bodke, who is the founder and CEO of Serenity, which is the most advanced genomic and AI-driven preventative care system in the world, created to serve the overreaching goal of extending the human lifespan by a decade within a decade. Their new preventative healthcare platform, 20questions.live, recently launched in March. The difference between early and late detection can often mean the difference between life and death. In fact, detecting breast and colon cancer at stage four increases survival rates by 71 to 77 percent. Early intervention can reverse 80 percent of type 2 diabetes diagnosis and prevent 34 percent of deaths caused by heart disease. Driven to create a solution to make early detection and treatment solutions available to everybody, Joe and his team designed 20questions.live, a first-of-its-kind platform, free for all to use. Visitors to the site are asked 20 personal health questions before being provided with accessible next-step solutions designed to close the person's care gap and bring them quickly up-to-date on screenings for chronic and acute diseases based on their responses. 20questions.live is backed by Serenity, the most advanced preventative medicine system in the world that uses superior diagnostic data with AI and human medical intelligence to detect genetic and real-time medical risks before they become life-threatening. We are seeing a huge shift where preventative medicine can help people be more in control of their health and their choices and stop something before it becomes a chronic illness because knowledge is power. It also helps physicians bring better care to their patients. Over the last couple of years, a lot of people have become very distrustful of the medical industry. And something like 20 Questions, where we're working on preventative health and preventative care, can help bridge the gap between that distrust and be able to trust the medical system that's working towards preventing something and keeping everyone in their optimal health. In this episode, you will hear ways that we can prioritize preventative health. What is population health? How can preventative care be made easy for patients? And why should genomics be the standard of care? So here is today's very esteemed guest, Joe Bodke, and he will explain what 20questions.live is and how it can save your life. Hi, Joe. Welcome to the Awakened Heart Podcast. Hi, Nancy. I'm very happy to be here. I'm excited to have you on here. And you are, uh, as we were talking before we hit live or record, that you're in my own stopping grounds. You're Mr. Santa Monica right now. I'm missing the that warm, sunny weather right now. We've had quite the winter here in the PNW, but I heard that you guys are getting doused as well with a little cooler and and, uh, it was surprisingly not as- cold, but I know what you, you mean. I was up in Portland over Christmas and that mm-hmm. was tough. I mean, it was a crazy blizzard thing and everything was icy. Yeah, it, we had the winter storm then and it was quite cold. And then we just got out of one about a week and a half ago. So, and I, I can't wait for spring. I can't wait for spring. And that being said, you know, spring and getting back outdoors and getting active and being healthy. And um, you developed something that I think is so needed right now, especially with the way we're seeing a deterioration in, you know, the Western world with a, you know, a lot of stressors or people haven't been going to the hospitals and or going to their regular doctor's appointments. So we're seeing a lot of disease happening and a lot of stuff that could have been prevented if it was detected early enough. And so you developed the 20 questions live, 
which just launched by the time this airs, it'll have just launched and it asks questions to get screenings where they can go in for early treatment. So it really is a, a diagnostic from what I understand to help people access to next step solutions. So the care gap can be shortened, right? Right. But you've had a um, quite a history in this kind of this field and it's, you know, you're utilizing AI technology with this. And I'm sure you can explain this a lot better. I would love for you to let our listeners kind of give an idea what your background is and maybe what led you to developing this type of system. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm kind of a weird mix. So I grew up in Germany, but I'm, I'm already mixed myself. So my dad is Thai actually. So he's from Thailand. He came to Germany, studied medicine, met my mom in med school. So I grew up in a very medical household. They were both also life science researchers. And so I saw kind of medicine from behind the scenes, including cutting edge research and including a lot of problems because my dad was in charge of like a state of all the microbiology, like all the infectious diseases. And when you're in charge of that, you get all the extreme cases, right? So you get all the cases that are not primary care anymore. Some weird, you know, people who travel to Africa and then suddenly get West Nile virus, like some weird things that are very dangerous that you don't get in Germany because the, normally these bugs are not there. And as part of that, I, you know, I heard all these crazy stories as a kid or a teenager at the dinner table where my dad said like, oh, it's very, mm, we got this young boy in or like a 16 year old and it's looking pretty bad. I don't think we can save him. And for me, as a, when I was 16, I heard this, like, this is very disturbing. Like there's a healthy 16 year old who has now to die. Why? And then my dad said like, well, we came to us one week late. It's a two week process. If you're one week late, you die because it's a highly infectious, dangerous disease, but you can treat it. And then he said, yeah, it was a typical primary care mistake. You know, they didn't ask the right questions. So you know, normally you, you go through the different questions, like, okay, how do you feel? Or you have a car, did you travel anywhere? So just to exclude certain tropical diseases. And of course, no one does that, even though you learn it in med school, because normally it doesn't happen. And so they get the wrong diagnosis or oh, take a little here, penicillin or something, go home, if it get worse, let me know. But you don't have that much time in this case. And so it, that was always disturbing to me that it's so easy and clear what you need to do to basically prevent all these infectious diseases from happening. And then they still happen a lot. Why? Because the system is just failing on basic guidelines on a massive scale. And the more I got into that, I don't want to go too deep into what I did in between. I was in corporate, right? I did. I was working on tech innovation for larger companies, then got into startups, then into venture capital. So I have like this whole journey on the business side to understand. I was always seeking out how innovation actually works, but I came all the way back into healthcare because I think the combination of having deeper medicine, medical knowledge from behind the scenes with being someone who really studied innovation a lot at the front lines, business innovation. That's a very potent mix because healthcare is in dire need of innovation. And there are many problems uh, also sy systemically with innovation. And so this is the combination where we ended up now with Quanchin, we are a precision medicine company, but also a population health and intelligence company. It's all about what I call medical intelligence. If you knew everything, you would have much less problems if you knew everything and would act on it. And so everything in medicine starts with that knowledge in the beginning, right? You don't even need to have super fancy genomics on the outset. You just need to start asking basic questions that are informed by very extensive, deep medical science and knowledge. And you have to ask the right people, the right questions in the right moment that alone would solve half of our healthcare problems. Because you could highlight, oh, Nancy is very you know, healthy right now, but she's actually, this is this risk profile because of her family history for this and that. She actually needed a screening one year ago that everyone overlooked. Now, the reason you needed that screening is deep science because over the last 50 years, people figured out that if your risk profile for that, you have to get these screenings every two years or whatever it is because that knocks down the risk of you dying of that disease by 90%. But if you don't do the screenings, 
you are full on risk. And this can get incredibly complicated because every human is different. Every, you know, there are different risk profiles, different data points. And so primary care docs are not, and they're very, they're overworked. So they're not asking, they, they don't even know all the questions that you have to ask. And so our 20 question technology is actually very simple to use, but very complex on the back end because these questions are adaptive, right? While you answer them, they change because they start asking specific questions. And so the system is very cool and gives you a dashboard where you see where you are late to what screenings and what, what other things, and then guides you how to do that. And if you want to pay a little bit of money, this whole thing is free, can pay a little money, and then you get your personal medical buddy to actually help you through this whole thing. And if you want, you can pay more money and then you get very advanced you know, technologies to do certain medical things if you want that. But if you don't want to spend money, you just get the 20 questions, the guiding and the dashboard. You can even take it to your primary care doc and you will never be late to anything anymore, mm -hmm. which would be amazing. Now, are these screenings, so maybe I go in for something that I may have overlooked or my primary overlooked, are these screenings like, you know, preventative care or, um, you know, do they work with insurance? Cause you know, you might be screened for something that might pop up, but it's not a, you know, under the technical preventative care label that you, you know, that insurance will cover. Are you seeing a lot of these things that pop up that are generally covered by, by your preventative care and your insurance? Because yeah. Yes. So we have at Quantum, we are, we are working on both ends of the spectrum, right? You're working on standard of care prevention, which is mostly what the 20 questions are designed for. And the short answer is yes, if you stay in network, I mean, it depends on what doctor you pick, but if you pick in network doctors, everything we recommend has to actually be covered under the law, Affordable Care Act, mm -hmm. because these are all guideline recommended screenings. The other end of the spectrum is we, we also offer very advanced precision medicine technologies, and they are sometimes covered, sometimes not covered, but often have, you know, in high deductible plans, you have to pay. So, but these are not standard of care. These are advanced multi-cancer detection tests, for example, genomics based that are not, not officially reimbursed as a standard procedure yet. So there it becomes more complex and you would expect to actually, you know, pay out of pocket. Okay. So you, you do these questions and then it would show you what you might need for screenings. And then is there a more advanced way that maybe somebody that might want to have something that's outside of the Western medicine paradigm or, you know, more Eastern or alternative healing? Um, could you be recommended something like that and what your guidance might be on that? Yeah, we have like two layers of the system. The first layer is and we call that the 20 question layer, right? Mm -hmm. This is all Western standard guideline based. So we can be sure people are in insurance, right? That's kind of the reason. And then, I mean, other, yeah, that is, you know, where everyone has to agree with and everyone has to pay and all the, and no, no primary care can say anything about it. It's just totally mm -hmm. clear. And that helps actually a lot. That's your base starting point. But unfortunately, 92% of Americans don't get all these recommended screenings. Mm -hmm. So we have an enormous problem on the standard side. Now on the more advanced side, that's what we call serenity. That's our serenity plan. We are not focused on Eastern yet in that. This is more focused on advanced genomics and imaging technologies. Um, but they're also not, they're, they're not fully recognized so it's not just the Eastern methods that are not recognized by Western medicine. It's also more advanced Western techniques that are in their mind. They're trying not to pay, right? There's like, well, yeah, they take cancer, but it's not cost effective mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. What do you mean not cost effective? Like, I don't want to die. What about that? It's like, well, it's not cost effective. So, so serenity is all about advanced medicine. And as part of that, you also get consultations with much better trained preventative care specialists. And they also talk about nutrition. They talk about stress. They talk about these kinds of things, mindfulness and how that influences cortisol and how that influences risks like obesity, cancer risk, cardiovascular. So 
there's also not full on Eastern, but it goes into these topics, right? So what is your social life? Are you stressed? What's your anxiety levels? And that can, that, these are one of the, some of the most detrimental uh, factors for your health if you do it wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, what would you say, because we've seen a complete breakdown over the last couple of years over a certain narrative that's being pushed about a certain uh, medical intervention that's, you know, the, it was a one size fits all. So a lot of people, we've seen what's happened in the hospitals. Uh, we've seen that they haven't instituted they were just sending people home. If you get worse then call us and people were dying, but you know, they weren't recommending vitamin D or Q certain or some of these other care or zinc or whatever. They weren't recommending like ways to keep yourself healthy. Like instead of just sanitizing your hands and wearing a mask, it was about getting out, breathing fresh air, getting your vitamin D, getting your exercise, manage your stress levels. So a lot of people, myself included, I don't, are very wary of the medical matrix and very wary of medicine in the hospital and all that hospitals. I think maybe your 20 questions and seeing that how it's an integrated approach and really, you know, looks like you're, you're trying to get to the root and the source and offer solutions um, for people to start trusting again, because a lot of people avoided going to the doctors and avoided going to the hospitals. Absolutely. And, and yeah. I know only certain things are allowed to be pushed. And there's even more censorship, especially in California, where the doctors are only allowed to say what is allowed to say. They're not even, even if they believe in something not to be a good course of action for a patient, they're not allowed to say it because they could lose their licenses and they can be barred from. So there's, there's got to be that doctor patient trust, and they've got to have trust in the system. How can you what you're offering help all those people that have become distrustful of the medical industry? I think that's a very, very good and very, very tricky question. Mm -hmm. Especially, I don't want to go into any kind of COVID details. Because no, of course. Very, very touchy for a lot of people on all sides, but I know what you mean. And I think you are absolutely right that there's an enormous breakdown of trust and, you know, in many respects, I think it's a justified breakdown of trust because we saw that, you know, in science, there is no doubt for any reasonable minded scientific observer that medical science has many problems, right? Called special interests and funding problems. Mm -hmm. And there are some industries like from, from health insurance to pharma that has an outsized influence of what's being done. And, I think people get wise to it. By the way, it's not just medicine, it's also greater all political stuff mm -hmm. that's about science at this point. Um, it's, you know, academic science is defined as science and academic science has a funding problem like everyone else, like politics. They're getting money from people, a lot of money from mm -hmm. food industry, from, but even things where, uh, it's even true in, in, in climate research, right? Where, uh, you know, even if you believe you know, of course, it's getting warmer and humans play a role in it, but it's also clear if you would ever find out that something maybe is not as clean cut, you don't get funded anymore. So we can't do science like that. I don't know the answers to all these questions. That's why I want good science. Mm -hmm. And I want scientists to be able to ask the right questions and then find the true answers, not the answers that give them more funding. And that's in nutrition, in pharma, in vaccinations and all these things. The problem is if you have such a distorted incentive system, you can't trust it anymore. And now maybe a majority of the population at this point gets it. And that means like, well, what now? Like who can we exactly trust? And doctors are also victims of that, right? Because a lot of doctors try to do the right thing, but then some do the wrong thing. Some say also stupid things. <laughs> some say the right things. and. You know, now it's a big mess. And I think for us as a company, it's clearly deep in healthcare and in medicine. We can also not just walk around and say random things, even if they are true, right? We have to, everyone has to be cautious, but we also need to do the right thing. And I think it is time that we're building brands like Serenity and the 20 questions, where it's not just, oh, these are doctors, trust them. 
that's a very dumb approach at this point. <laughs> but it's that's why I'm on podcasts, for example. It's about okay, you have to make up your own mind. Like if you if I expect our customers and patients and members to trust us, I need to be in front of a camera and tell them who I am and how we are funded and what we want and what our objectives are. And that's how you're building trust. I think the only way to build trust is through transparency and humanizing things also on our side, right? Who's, who am I? Why am I doing that? Who do I have contracts with? Who gives us money? I think you just have to tell people. And the funny thing, or not funny, the sad thing in healthcare, you know, if you look at whatever, like if you look at cars, Elon Musk, everyone knows Elon Musk. He's there, you might hate him or love him, but you know who he is. And you know what I like he, what he's doing on Twitter. I exactly. mean, I don't know what the bigger motive is, but I like how he's uh, how he's cleaning he's, up Twitter. And he's transparent, right? He's yeah. like whatever you think of him, you can get information from him, and then you can form your opinions. He lying, is he not lying? But at least there is something to deal with. And you know, it comes to across to me as someone who really, you know, is himself and tries to do his things. Mm -hmm. Now, if I ask you for you know, when was the last time a pharma representative, like a Pfizer representative, for example, explained to you who they are and who, how he earns his money and all these things, or a United Healthcare executive, right? So it's very intransparent. And I think that's a big mistake. Mm -hmm. I think we have to personalize medicine. I think people are getting smarter and understand being a doctor alone is not enough. It's like the question, who are you and who are you? Right. And why do I trust you? And we have a relationship and that's how it should be. Or in bigger organizations, who is the CEO? Who's the founder? What do they actually want truly? And the only way to form an opinion is transparency and having open discussions. And I'm not saying we're doing everything right, but we want to do everything right. So I think that I think that makes a difference. And then do you believe me or not? Well, that's why I'm on camera and you can form your opinion. It's true, like a weird guy I don't trust. Maybe some people think that and then they shouldn't trust me. Other people might might think, well, I don't know, Joe comes across as like authentic, so I trust him. And then I think we have to go back to the basics. Like mm -hmm. if you trust your body and life to some brand or some solution, get to know these people. I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so important. It's an individual approach and it's it goes back to relationships and um and uh, you know, vibing with the personality and trusting that intuition. And we've been slapped down so many, like, I'm not going to take, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to take blood pressure medicine when I don't need blood pressure medicine. And it's, we're all individualistic and working on that trust again, it's so important. And relationships are so important. And, and I, by the way, Nancy, yeah. I had a very good conversation yesterday with, or two days ago with another podcast. It was like, also, you know, a similar space. He's more on the personal fitness and uh, kind of, you know, how, how do you grow it building like a, like, how do you get big energy and everything? And my advice is like, everyone should be the CEO of their own life. I love and, that. and if someone comes to me as a CEO of Quantine, like a vendor, right? So, oh, we do security or we do this and that we do software. I am the decision maker. Right? You can't just come in here and say, oh, Joe, out of the way, I know how to do your, your, your doors or something. It's like, dude, I'm paying you. So you have to tell me what the plan is. And I make a decision. Maybe I ask someone else. In healthcare, that's how the patient-doctor relationship should be. The doctor should be a specialized, smart expert who advises you mm -hmm. on what needs to be done. You listen to him or her and form your opinion. And if you say like, wait, but I don't totally get it. That makes no sense. So you're saying I should take this and that thing, but I'm also obese. I read obesity is bad for my health. Shouldn't I just lose weight and go jogging more or something? And body then positivity. Body positivity. <laughs> I know, but so exactly. So, you know, I think we live in like trying times because mm -hmm. there's so much fake news and weird stuff out there and twisted interests that it's a little bit te a test for all of us. Mm -hmm. It's like an evolution. Like back in the days, if you weren't cautious, something kills you. I think nowadays, if you're not cautious, you're doing dummy things, you kill yourself kind of, like it ends badly. And I think what you need to get, everyone should get trained and it's like, be your own CEO. Like say, well, listen to everything. Also don't shut down certain media because it, it hurts your feelings. Like, no, try to get the information. 
then connect the dots and make an assessment. Does that make any sense what that person is saying? Or does it make more sense what that person is saying after listening to everyone? Mm -hmm. And also then discount, I think I would always discount authority a little bit. If I meet a smart, random person who's just smart and the other guys, I don't know, the secretary of health and human services, they don't have more authority than this person. Mm -hmm. Like, where does this come from? Because you're a politician? No. Like, no, you know nothing more about my body than that person. So mm -hmm. it's important to just, I think, listen to people, form your own opinion. And that's how we build the future of healthcare, in my opinion. More mm -hmm. personal, more transparent, having more open discuss discussions, and not shutting people down and saying, oh, you're not a doctor, you're not a scientist. Like, well, what does it mean to be a scientist? It means look at the facts, connect the dots, form a theory, and stress test it. That's a scientist. If you do that, you're a better scientist than most scientists. Mm -hmm. So it's having that discernment and it's not putting one above the other. Of course, you're going to take advice for someone that might've you know, spent all those years in medical school, but it's going back to intuitively listening to ourselves and our body and trusting ourselves. And, you know, so many people have, we're so out there. We're so in the mind. We're so looking for blame or put responsibility on something else instead of taking ownership of being the CEO of our own company, which is our body and our health. And then working right. together with companies like yourselves and the doctors that we are recommended by or that we're already working with and having some, having synergy and, uh, you know, living the best life that we can with everything that is available to us, like the whole spectrum, you know, Western medicine, Eastern medicine, vitamins, outside exercise, stress reduction. And um, I know that you use AI technology is really big on this. So the 20 questions are always the same 20 questions. And is it, it might be a different result. So say I take it a year, year ago, and then two years later, I take it again, it'll offer a different result, correct? Yes, exactly. Okay. So this is a it's not always the same 20 questions. Okay. You just made it simple behind the scenes. Sometimes it's 18 and sometimes it's 21, but mm -hmm. they are adaptive and they are also subordinate questions. So if you say for two certain questions, yes, you get actually much more questions than 20, but it learns very quickly and asks you the right questions to connect it into, you know, scientific knowledge about what, what's necessary and guidelines. And, um, and you also write that you need to repeat the question. So once you're in the system, we kind of remind you, okay, it's time to answer two more questions, like after six months, for example, because yeah. you, need to get it, you need to keep it current. Mm -hmm. I mean, one very simple example is your family history of cancer. So uh, that determines a lot of risk for people outside heart genetic testing, which is also important sometimes, but the first step is to ask what family members had cancer so we can build a better risk profile and that informs when you should get screened for what cancer but of course unfortunately people get cancer so what if you have no cancer history but in two years a family member gets diagnosed with cancer of course that changes your questions too that's why you have to keep asking questions from time to time then you have other questions. Did you get screened? Did you do your annual physical? Like when was the last time you did an annual exam? And you say, well, nine months ago. Well, then six months later, it's 15 months ago. So, and then it pops up. Well, now you're actually getting late or mammograms and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's an ongoing system that it's kind of a medical intelligence layer that, help, that helps you not fall through the cracks. Mm -hmm. So it gets to know the individual over time. So Nancy might be different than Sally or Lisa. So we can log on the same time, but it's going to look at. Exactly. Our, yeah. And, it and Nancy is also different from Nancy in the future. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Past, present, future happening at the same time. <laughs> We're not there yet. Um, <laughs> so what about somebody like myself who's adopted and I don't have any medical history for uh, family members and besides getting your whole genetic profile done, how does well, it that's get to know myself? It's a very smart question and a very tricky one because obviously we are talking about your biological family. If you don't know that family, mm -hmm. then you don't have a family history. Mm -hmm. And that puts a big question mark on it. So there's a big chunk missing. And of course, you can compensate that actually very effectively with 
genetic testing, but it needs to be clinical grade genetic testing then. Mm -hmm. That's the only way I see how to do something about that. And that's also something because we are a genetics company, there are these upgradable services, but that's, that is unfortunately out of pocket mm -hmm. because your insurance is going to say, I mean, there you run into exactly these problems. The insurance, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure out that you should get genetic testing for your risk profile. And obviously that's very important, but the insurance says, no, it's not important. And why do they say that? Because they don't want to pay. Because they know, well, Nancy is probably not going to be with us anymore because she's going to, in average, switch her insurance plan every two and a half years. Therefore, we are not willing to invest that because someone else benefits from it, which is like as dark as it gets. But that's exactly literally what they tell us. Hmm. My God. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually surprisingly dark and it's surprisingly... Uh, the insurance... It's surprising that the people in charge don't even really see the problem anymore and saying things mm -hmm. like that. For a normal human, it's like, did you just tell me that you don't care if your members die of cancer because mm -hmm. they won't be your members at that point, statistically? And there's literally, yeah, what's the problem? It's like, well, I don't even know how to explain that. It's dark. I see we need a whole new reform on insurance. Like if, if anybody, any of the lists I'm sure you have, have had to go and pick out insurance plans based on your income or based with your company and then out of pocket and private blah. Oh my God. It's such a, you know, one like blue cross can have like a hundred or so different plans and it's just so confusing. And uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I can't wait till that whole thing is over. What Then it will help what you're trying to do even well we actually better. like on, and that's what where quantine is going is clearly you know we are building on the serenity on the advanced medicine side already a supplemental plan that costs 99 dollars a month that gives you access to advanced precision medicine uh, and that works with ppo plans so we are moving into that direction because i know in the end of the day in the end of that innovative phase or revolution we are in we need to be a health plan because if you're not a health, you need to have a new form of plan that says, mm -hmm. okay, you pay a certain amount, probably less than current plans, but let's see about that. And you provide your members with true protection, which in involves all the things you mentioned. Like what about being active, being outside? What about vitamin D? What about this and that? What about, of course, the plan can't make medical recommendations. So when it gets into new of things, course. you give people, it's, not the easiest way to handle this whole thing, but you can you can make recommendations and guide guiding systems and support systems so people actually do the right thing that keeps them healthy. Because mm -hmm. there is what I learned is like doing this for a while now and digging the very deep into the healthcare system. There are two sorts of problems. One is just malicious. That's like a special problem. I mean, same way as defense companies are not totally against wars because they like to sell bombs, right? So it's just hard to, for them to not say that. You have certain industries in healthcare, especially pharma, that just clearly wants to sell more drugs. Mm -hmm. It's just, it, I mean, there's no denying it and that's clearly disconnected from patient and health interests. But the other type of problem is that a lot of healthcare plans have kind of the right incentives. Because if you would be more healthy, they have to pay less money. But it's so complicated that there's complacency and they are stopping innovation despite the innovation being in their own interest because it's too much work. And so on that front, the system would actually be very supportive for more innovation. Right? If you invent a healthcare plan and everyone in that plan is much more healthy because you're doing the right things, that's not bad for the plan because then you have less healthcare expenses. So there you can make a decision that's maybe more, more exhausting. You have to do more innovation and think more, but you're also getting rewarded in the end as a company. So I think that's where, that's where a lot of innovation is going to come from the next five years. Mm -hmm. So you're saying maybe some other, this will be tied into some other kind of health plan or it's where someone might pay a little bit and um, be part of this health plan and maybe a network of doctors that are in this health plan or something exactly. like that. Oh, I love that's that. How you, that's I want how, out. 
of the medical cartel. I don't trust them at all. We're, I'm looking for alternative doctors and a lot of them are sprouting up. I trust the doctors that have spoken up from the very beginning. But Nancy, here's the, That's here's where I'm the, at. Power, of, here's the power of creating a new sort of plan. This mm -hmm. plan can decide who's in network. So you can go to doctors that have proven that they have their own, you know, that they use their brain and the mm -hmm. patients. You can go, you can get doctors in network who use more alternative treatments that are proven or shown to be effective. Of course, not random stuff, but things that are effective. So you have all the freedom in the world to pay for these things as a plan mm -hmm. if you look for the right things that actually keep people healthy. And so it's it's not easy because it needs to work in the end, the dollar numbers, right? Because it's a business, you get people, you get money in and you pay people. But that's where the real innovation can come from, the only place. Because you you need kind of a, a plan where Nancy can say, you know what, I, I looked at the doctors in the plan. They are doctors I trust more because mm -hmm. they're more transparent, they're more smart, they're looking into more directions. And so I like the plan more. And the plan costs maybe the same as my other plan, so I switch. That's the only way to empower these doctors. Otherwise, they're just running against the, the other plans who say, no, you're not allowed to do this and that, and you have mm -hmm. to do certain things. And um, that, so that's why I believe that's like, uh, from an entrepreneurial point of view, the, the answer. You, if you don't get to a plan level and create new plans that listen to patients like you and your listeners, and builds a network of doctors that these patients actually trust and like, that's how you do it because someone has to be the payer and that, that then creates a good or bad plan depending on what they're willing to pay for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why I've always been into, I usually only have to thank God, only go to the doctor for my preventative care. And because I always like going to, I want the root cause. I want to keep myself healthy, which you're advance, you know, getting people these questions and getting their early screenings and everything, because I would go to a doctor for something and I'd be like, they're like, here, take this pill. No, I don't want a freaking pill. Tell me what's wrong with me. And I was like, God, and this is way before I even like knew as much as I know now. I'm like, why do they just want to push these pills? I don't want to be on a pill that's going to do ABCD, EFG, HIJKLMLP side effects. But yeah, I, that's what, preventative. So important. Keep our bodies from getting these types of disorder and diseases. That's going to alter our Absolutely. quality of life. That's 100% true. And again, because I'm, I'm, you know, we have a lot of things going on in healthcare and things and everything. I, I always have to be a little cautious, but it's like, you don't, again, don't need to be Einstein to connect the dots. Like, you know, medication by definition is some highly refined chemical that does very specific things in a very like unnatural way to your body and that is pushing you out of balance and so sometimes that might be the right thing right if you have something that would naturally kill you you have to push yourself out of balance mm -hmm. because balance means death for example bacterial infections there was a 70% you know, mortality rate for some very basic infections a lot of people have. Uh, today, it's like, oh, penicillin, you're done. Well, unfortunately, we don't give penicillin anymore. It's like we give these broadband antibiotics that are very bad for many reasons. So mm -hmm. anyway, so this, I'm not saying medications are bad, but you have to be aware if you take medications in nearly all instances, they do something very unbalancing to your body with a lot of ripple effects. And so the odds, if you don't have a condition that is really dangerous, that naturally would push you off, the odds that a medication is helpful are not that high. Mm -hmm. And in, in America, it's a very medication-friendly system, right? In Germany, there, there's much more constraint on medication. Mental health, for example, is also a, a crazy thing that's going on. Like in, in Germany, to get a mental health prescription for some, you know, a psychiatric drug is very difficult because we would say stuff shouldn't like just fly around and here everyone's like oh i can focus let's get some adderall it's like right have you ever read the side so effects or long term effects and all these things is is very bad so i can also i'm totally with you on that side you have to be very very protective of your body and your natural balance 
And it always sounds a little esoteric, ooh, the balance and the spirit. You can just That's break true. it down to hormonal things, right? You can say like, well, we know exactly what it does. You know, that amps up your cortisol or brings it down or, or messes up your testosterone. Like all these things are measurable. It's not like theoretic. And then you have the ripple effects. So yes, I would stay as natural as you can. You just have to understand at what point you have something that really requires medical attention, of course. Mm -hmm. But preventatively, what if you just feel a little bad or can't focus or something, then maybe there are deeper reasons that you should mm -hmm. address. And be able to go to a doctor and talk about these things and then offer maybe, I mean, because I've seen people certain, you know, changing their diet or certain um, nutrition or, you know, eliminating certain things or, uh, or, or some kind of supplement and it's gone away. So be able to offer these different approaches instead of here, take Adderall or here, take this or that, which is good for someone that is really imbalanced. If it does come to that and these other things don't work in Western medicine, does have a lot of great things. I mean, Jesus, they made so many great strides. And, you know, if you're going to get in a car accident, you really freaking, you know, need yeah. it. But what you're helping do is to help people detect this early on before it becomes something, before it becomes something that's out of balance in your body. So if, you know, you're inflamed or something's happening, something else in your body is out of balance. So it's like, you were right. It is, it's not just esoteric because it's, it's an overall approach, you, you know, it's mind, bodily, and spirit. It's, it's your whole body, not just like this wound or this, whatever it's a headache. There's other things that are going on, maybe a muscle tension, all that stuff. So another example is also A1C testing. I'm a big fan of A1C testing. So that's like three months average blood glucose levels. That is a huge insight into what's going on. Also slightly contested, a little unclear, is it guideline recommended to do it every year or not and for whom? So we gravitate towards saying everyone should just do it because it tells you if your blood sugar is off and your blood sugar is a huge insight into what's going on. Like, is your diet wrong? Is you, are you overweight? Are you stressed? All kinds of things. And getting blood sugar under control is very important. It's an enormously damaging problem. Diabetes and all the follow-up problems. And a lot of people could be detected much earlier that they are pre-diabetic, for example. And it's not just overweight people, by the way. It can also be people who look in good shape, but they have a sugar problem. So there are many little things. And early detection is, that's where your body is least out of balance. Right? if you wait too late, it's, you have a lot of problems. And it's unnecessary. You just have to answer a bunch of questions. Now, what are you seeing as far as diseases or disorders between it being genetic or environmental, are you seeing a change in that your father? Is, oh, oh, you were yeah. frozen for a second. <laughs> I, I lost you for a second, but I think your question was genetic versus environmental. Mm -hmm. and how yes. The diseases. Of course, it's a very complex question, but the bottom line is that we understand genetics more and more. And I would say it becomes more and more clear that an enormous number, if not all diseases, have a genetic component, but they also have a huge environmental component. And what genetics really does is not telling you, oh, you're going to get that condition. It, it's going to tell you, are you more at risk? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So if you have, for example, a 3 or 10x higher risk for Parkinson's or for Alzheimer's, um, or for a specific cancer, like, oh, you are three times higher risk for, for lung cancer. Does that mean you get it? Of course not. It tells you you're just more at risk. Mm -hmm. And what I always advise our uh, members and patients is, well, if you know you're at very elevated risk, why don't you go into, or we can help you with that, why don't you look at what, what are these factors that drive up mm -hmm. the chance of getting that mm -hmm. cancer? Because you really have to watch out on that. And, and for Alzheimer's, of course, we know it's some people call it type three diabetes, right? It's if you constantly have elevated blood sugar and you have all these metabolic problems, that seems to make it more likely that you develop neurodegenerative diseases. So that's very important. Be in very good shape. Watch your nutrition. Do your exercise. Do your mindfulness. And be not too stressed and try to be very balanced and healthy, which funnily enough is often the what you should do, right? I mean, that's also true for cancer. That's true for other things. But it, it gets people, you know, puts it, you a little bit more at awareness. 
in cancer types, I mean, sometimes it just it changes your screening frequency. So certain people with very high risk of colon cancer, they have to get a colonoscopy every year, for example, not every 10 years, um, because it's likely that they get it. So you want to have tighter increments. And um, yeah, I can go on and on with that. So I think that's that's how genetics is intelligently used, right? It's telling you your profile, what are the things you are actually less at risk than the average and what are the things you're more at risk. And the more at risk, then you can focus your attention on that in prevention and say, okay, what, what if it's a certain cancer type, what is what are the main drivers for that? And how can I really stay away from that as far as I can? Mm, it totally makes sense. And putting it that way, just you're going to see, you know, these, what you could be predisposed for and you don't necessarily have to get it or, um, but you can see, okay, these are all the things I need to do. Cut out sugar, you know, if I, Alzheimer's predisposed to Alzheimer's exercise. So you can do all these preventative measures. So you don't, it doesn't escalate into that exactly. disease or disorder. Great. And that's also like some people also ask us like, oh, I don't even want to know. I don't want to do screenings right. and genetics. I don't want to know. That's, you know, going back to where we started with being the CEO of your body. That's not how a CEO behaves. Mm -hmm. Like if you're a CEO of a company, oh, I don't want to know if we are going broke next month. It would be so bad. It's like, well, you're the CEO. Your body relies on you to not be a baby, right? So face the facts and then make the best out of it. Then you have the best life. Mm -hmm. because if you just hide can't hide from reality that's the problem well i would love to know what i'm i might be predisposed for i'm going to do definitely you know when you're up do these 20 questions but um yeah i mean i don't know because i'm adopted i mean i just do a you know generally a really healthy lifestyle. I do love my sugar, but I, in balance, I love my pies and stuff, I but, I'm, too, but it's very bad. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I always have to have something sweet, but I, you know, exercise, I get sun. I'm re very careful and I'm very, I intuit what's going on with my body. So, but I would love to know if freaking insurance would cover it because I know genetic testing is very expensive and just, it's, there's a lot of other things that I would do, but I'm limited by what my insurance will pay for. I usually seek alternative treatments when I am, you know, acupuncture and I'm always one to go out into that field when I can have money to spend out of pocket. And then, I mean, we are trying to make this much more transparent because people are very, if you go to your insurance and conventional doctor and order start orange genetic test, they can go to out of hand. So we, you know, we offer very clean cut thing it's 950 dollars and you get it out of the way it's all 25 mm -hmm. genes plus consultation including pharmacogenomic testing which is like which genes which variants do you have that impact any prescription drugs you take where you need different dosage and that's of course you shouldn't take any drugs anyway if you don't need to but if you get an accident or get diagnosed with a bad disease it's very important mm -hmm. to know that because for cancer patients like if you do pharmacogenomics that excludes certain chemotherapies because you see now we are seeing much more why people die under chemotherapy, right? If you have these variants, that just kills you, the chemotherapy. If you don't have the variants, it doesn't as much. And that's a very necessary thing now, genetic testing for these pharma interactions, if you have any kind of complex treatment. But beyond that, you know, that's what we are trying to introduce, like precision medicine on a very, on the highest precision level and quality level for, I mean, $950 is like, kind of, of course, a lot of money, but it's also a once in a lifetime thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you go to an insurance company, it's like, oh, you only need BRCA testing. It's only 290 bucks that you have to pay while well, you get one gene, not 20,000 genes. So next day you kind of say, oh, by the way, now you need like whatever, KRAS testing or something, or you need this and that. And it's basically what they're saying, look, one gene is 950. We are not paying for that. We are paying 290 for BRCA. Well, but do you have to do this 20,000 times to get mm -hmm. them out? So that's what they're not telling you. And then, so we believe like, okay, you need a thing that tests you completely on all your genes, gets the core data from the lab. And from there, if there's new learnings in the future, we know that in the cloud. Mm -hmm. Because we basically read all your genes. We know all the genes. And if there's no knowledge on a certain variant, maybe there comes new knowledge in one year that explains what that is, but we don't have to test you again because we're in mm -hmm. 
basically like taking a big photo of Earth, of a planet, of your planet. And even if you don't understand what something means today, in the future, once we figure it out, we can still connect it because we have the photo. Whereas they say like, well, we're not paying for that. We are only taking this tiny little photo here because we know that. And then we have to take 20,000 photos, but. Mm -hmm. Only $950 for all that? Like, I, I don't know. Like everybody needs to get this. I would spend I up, like so. 950 huge... isn't bad at all. No, it's not bad because we, we compressed it into a singular workflow, right? We say like, no, mm -hmm. what is the cheapest we can make that the most affordable with no compromises? Like mm -hmm. get all 20,000 coding genes and read them all out and analyze it. Um, and that's the price. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's, it's more like an approach innovation because, you know, that's other people might say it's like 2000, but no one is going to say that would be 20,000. But if you start doing individual genes, yeah, then you have a big problem because you run the whole thing and then you have only one gene and next time you need to run it again. And this is expensive. The laboratory core infrastructure is expensive. So we try to do it once for everything. And that was a dramatic improvement in cost. But now the insurance says, why would we pay you 950? If we can pay this guy 290. And then we say, because it's one gene, we do 20,000. It's like, well, <laughs> but for her, I mean, she's probably not with us anymore in three years. We don't care about the rest. We do oh this. Oh my goodness. Thing. Goodness. Yeah. I always thought it was like, you know, $5,000. Maybe I looked into it years ago and was a couple thousand dollars. I mean, 950. I'm like, I'm going to put that on my, uh, <laughs> my wish list. So where do they go for that? Is it through your 20 light 20 question site or is that through your, um, through serenity or it will be very soon on the 20 questions. Okay. Also as an option. Um, and you will have a, hopefully a texting buddy soon anywhere on the 20 questions so you can always ask tell me more about genetics and then you get in touch automatically okay i'm definitely going to be doing that down the road once i move and <laughs> some other <laughs> expenses happen but i think it's so important because you do it once it's just like i've done the ancestry dna which somebody I mean, recently scary. bought it and i'm a little afraid of what they're going to do with it now but literally it changes all the time like before you have i'd have some eastern european descent and then it just you know now i know i have french and now i have now i have italian just how it keeps changing as they get more information and i think it's so cool that part and it's the same with this gene testing is it's all in there and as you advances in technology as soon as you learn more boom you get more updated results absolutely yes and i, I mean they are not allowed to do clinical testing because you need different approvals for it. So you need a real clinical grade genetics lab. So mm -hmm. Ancestry tests some genetics, but mm -hmm. it's a much less involved technical thing, but it's a good starting point. So we are doing the full gamut of actual clinical grade testing of all 20,000, 30 right. million locations and different kinds of other perspectives then have to curate it clinically. Mm -hmm. There's a clinical geneticist looking over everything and then you get also a clinical uh, genetic consultation on it, which is very important because you're not allowed to just give these results to people because no one understands them. Mm -hmm. So if something says pathogenic, what does it even mean? Is right. it mean you're sick or not sick? Or So though you get a, basically a consultation included in that with a very nice, with our head of genetic counseling, and she's a very nice person and very knowledgeable. And then you have a very good understanding of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For the answer, I think they do do the genes, but no, I just did it to find you know, the spit in the thing, $80, mail it off to just to see where my, you know, what ethnicities my bloodline has. And I'd much rather go with a site like yours where you're getting counseling. Cause it's, it's just like when you get an astrology reading is like the moons and what my rising, like, I don't understand that at all. These symbols, it's like, I, I don't know what are the, the human design, the human design. It's like, Oh gosh, I have no idea. But uh, yeah, there's a little bit more liability on the, on the genetic counselor than on of the, course. <laughs> of course, of yeah. course. Yeah, I think everybody definitely needs to go and do these questions. And then when that is available, I think that, you know, that gene is so important and it's such a reasonable price and everything that is included in that is pretty incredible. So, so wonderful. So can you tell everybody where to go? I'm, I think you set the website already, but can you again, um, 20 questions yeah, live, right? Have exactly 20 questions dot live live as in your life not being live 
And for the genetics, we will have very soon uh, our precision medicine plan up uh, where you can get access to genetic testing and some other things at a much more affordable rate. So that will be at serenityplan.health. And then if you want to look me up, I'm at joebakdi.com. That's easy, J-O-B-H-A-K-D-I. It's actually not easy. But... And then the company is uh, quantine.com, Q-U-A-N-T-G-E-N-E.com. Okay, I'm going to put that in the show notes so everybody can go and do this. And yeah, well, I think it's uh, wonderful, everything that you're doing and offering. And uh, it's so important for, for everyone to have the most thriving, what is the word, vibrant health possible? Because what what is life if you're in pain or if you have disease? Like nothing, nothing is really... It's no fun when you're in pain or when your health is not in the most optimal health you can be. It's like, oh gosh, I can't do anything. I don't feel good, you know? So, you know, or you pull your back out and it's like, I don't want to do anything. I'm in so much pain. So, so like, yeah, thank you. So one last question I ask, how should I ask this one? I always ask, I'm going to ask you, what does it mean for you to live with an awakened heart or what? What is like it for you to approach health from an awakened heart? Well, for me, these things are very related in my specific case, because I think for me doing what I do, I just, I wouldn't even say I'm totally honest that I got lucky with that specific thing because it was very purposeful how I built my life around this. So for me, it's very important that I can do things I truly care about that it's my purpose, what I'm doing, and I truly believe in what I'm doing. That was not always the case. So if I'm working in corporate or, you know, something, and you feel like, hey, I'm doing the job here because I have a boss and they pay me money and that's why I'm doing it, you misalign yourself. And then, and that's not awakened, or maybe you are awakened and see you live in a little nightmare. That's also bad. (laughs) (laughs) Do you want to have a, you want to have an awakened heart and then structure your life so it matches that heart not awaken and see, oops, this is all messed up. So, and that's very important for me. And that gives me much more energy. I think you're this energetic being and you have all your emotional systems. And it's important that your world that you're constructing around you matches this emotional constellation. So you're in sync. That's what really harmony means. You have a bunch of emotional incentives that are you and you have a world that is around you that you can influence. And if they're in mismatch, you're in constant... Pain, emotional pain or unfulfilling you shut down because you don't want to get hurt like you want you don't want to get constantly confronted with not getting not living your best life and if you rearrange that you're much more free flowing and i think that's very powerful and that then affects your health mm-hmm. because if you if you have free flowing energy like if everything is aligned I sound like a Californian, but it's. <laughs> no, it's <true>. but, <laughs> I use that all the time. Aligned, sovereign. I think this alignment is what it means. Like, what do you? Tr- can you truly explore who you are and what you really want, and not be skewed by some narrative from outside, and then measure the world you constructed around you against that, and then see is that in is that in sync? When I take action, is it the action I want to take? Does it move the world in the direction that? makes it a nicer world for me and that's more aligned and if that is the case then you're on a winning path Mm -hmm. then you're more happy and I truly believe that happiness that comes from that upward like trajectory whatever that means for you is the key to health because that keeps you actually healthy because if you're super in shape and you walk out every day and you get your vitamin D, but you do it under stress mm-hmm. because we're like, I'm, I'm, I'm like haunted or something. I need to have a perfect body. That's not healthy. You're going to get a heart attack at some point. But if you're just driven inter- intrinsically by your motivations and the world plays along because you arranged it that way at some point, it's hard, but once you're there, I think that makes you happy and happy makes you live longer. Mm-hmm. And that's such a wonderful, beautiful feeling to be aligned 
and to be doing something that you, because we spend so much time working and to wake up on Sunday and dread going to work and hating your boss and hating your work and just finding no fulfillment. Like you said, you could work out, you could get your vitamin B, you could eat, eat perfectly, but you're going to just not have that alignment and just be miserable and wake up, awaken and be like, this sucks. <laughs> but when you align, yeah, when you align it all, like, you know, that's an awakened heart and you're giving back, like being so happy or being so fulfilled in what you're doing. And you, you know, that, you know, it's helping so many people like that. That's the best of all worlds. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes. Well, Joe, thank you so much for this conversation. And uh, I can't wait to, um, I'm going on. I can't wait to go on once this launches and uh, answer my 20 questions. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Nancy. I can't wait to, to get the site up and, you know, welcome you as a, as a user. That would be amazing. Oh. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. It was a lot of fun and I love your podcast. I oh. hope you have a lot of success and a lot of inspired um, listeners. And yeah, hope to see you soon on 20 Questions. Yes. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Right. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Awaken Heart Podcast. If you've enjoyed what you've heard today, share it with a friend. And if you haven't already, head on over to your favorite podcast app to subscribe, rate, and review. If you have any comments, questions, or feedback, you can reach me at the awakenheartpodcast.com.